Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, we have two feature stories for you. Is it possible to bring high-speed internet to rural areas? One Iowa city has. And our Southern Gardening segment today, try the African daisy for a great variety of color and shapes. In the food factor, want to spend less at the store? Speed shopping is the answer. Our first feature story today is about a Mississippi family that's raising its fourth generation of tree farmers. We have tried to make sure that we um, continue what my dad started, try to make sure that we, we keep it up, and I look forward to leaving it into it in better shape than what I found it. everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford. Welcome to Farm Week. Today it's a feature story edition of our show. Artis, our very first feature is about the present Mississippi Forestry Association Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year, Roy Thigpen of Montrose, Mississippi. His story is a great example of land and trees as a legacy. Thigpen is now working to pass that legacy on to a fourth generation. Thigpen received his award last October at the MFA's annual meeting. Yeah, it's, um, it's basically a full-time job. It's something all the time. Even though he is 76, Roy Thigpen is far from being retired. He's too busy growing trees and growing a legacy. I've never seen anybody work as hard as I've seen him um, since, since we've been here. He has really put his heart and soul into it. Roy and his wife, Julia, have lived on this tree farm 14 years, but the connection to this land is lifelong for Roy. The property has been a certified tree farm since 1960. The legacy began with Roy's father, Chester Thigpen, seen in this Farm Week video from 20 years ago. Chester became interested in tree farming long before most people realized the potential wealth of the state's timber industry. Chester was named the state's Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year for 1994-1995. And in 1996, he and his wife Rosette were honored as the National Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year. Although Chester and Rosette have since passed away, a sign on the property serves as a constant reminder of their achievement and the legacy connected to this tree farm. Today, under Roy's stewardship, the property has been described by an official of the American Forest Foundation as one of the best managed and well-kept loblolly pine stands he's ever seen. On the day of our visit, Roy was overseeing a second thinning in this 30-year-old plantation on the property. This crew had already completed a first thinning of this much younger stand of timber nearby on the tree farm. Registered forester Craig Youngblood had just started as Roy's consultant when these trees were planted 15 years ago. We just went ahead and got the logger to kind of come through and um, cut us some, some corridors. And we really didn't thin anything to the side, we just cut the corridors out and allowing these trees to put on a little bit um, more diameter. Mr. Thigpen is, is one of my more active uh, landowners. He does a lot of maintenance on the property. He's constantly working out here. He's doing, uh, maintaining the roads, uh, bush hogging areas that you would never think you'd need to take your bush hog in just to open it up and so he can, you know, tell people, you know, this is, it looks, make it look a lot better. He, he asks a lot of questions. He goes to a lot of forestry meetings. He gets ideas and then he, he, he tries to do it himself, which is, which is great. Another example of some of the forest management work done on the tree farm in the last five years includes the harvest of this 45-acre tract of timber and its replanting in loblolly pine. And after we clear cut it, we came back in, uh, in, in, uh, in 2012 and just let it lay out in 12. In 13, we did an aerial herbicide application to kill the uh, woody and grassy vegetation. And uh, that was done in August of, uh, of last year. 
And uh, in November of last year, 13, 2013, we uh, got the Forestry Commission to come in and burn it, burn it for us. So in January of this year, 2014, we replanted it. Well, we've, we've been, been involved with the Thick Pen Tree Farm for, you know, for 50 years, our agency. And uh, over the last uh, 25 years or so, we were involved uh, helping the Thick Pens plant trees uh, using various cost share programs. Uh, but over the last few years, we've been uh, helping them a lot, doing some prescribed burning, uh, trying to uh, help them improve their stands of trees, uh, and uh, putting in fire lanes, and that's how we've been helping uh, Mr. Roy and his family. In addition to calling on professionals to help him manage his farm better, Roy is also involving the next generations of fig pens in order to grow the legacy his father began. Roy and his wife Julia are actively involving the third and fourth generations of the family now in the management work on the tree farm. Grandson Roy Thigpen III, known as Trey, and son Roy Thigpen Jr. say they are grateful they have a chance to be involved. Uh, one thing that he got me myself and my son out here to do was just to uh, learn how to do some control burning. Uh, one of the first things that he made sure was prepared first was uh, we got the lane set up. Uh, and then from there, you know, we just took a small area, uh, I want to say maybe a little under uh, 15 acres, tw uh, 15, 20 acres, and we just did a complete walk around in order to get the fire going in. And then once we felt comfortable that, uh, uh, that the, everything was burning, then we walked through the lanes in order to ensure that we got um, the area covered well. It was, I guess, being a young guy, it was kind of fun, you know, getting to play with a little bit of fire and. Uh, it was also fun, you know, getting to learn something new, you know, how, uh, how I got to, uh, I guess, burn off the natural vegetation and, you know, what it's actually for, you know, to help the, uh, to help the trees grow. So it was a great experience for me. It's great to see, you know, my grandfather, you know, do the things that he loves. I like to say that he's my role model. He puts a, uh, sets a great example for me and I like to uh, follow his footsteps. And you again, it's a great example of what, you know, uh, a significant asset, land and timber can be to, to a family and how they're, they're managing it. And then, you know, uh, you're watching it go from one generation to another and each generation is being taught how to manage it, how to properly manage it, to get the appropriate help. And, and, and that's really important, that they're bringing that next generation along. In addition to his family, Roy Thigpen also promotes forestry to others. One recent event on the farm was a field day for youth for the National Wild Turkey Federation. And in December 2012, he hosted a field day here for the National Network of Forest Practitioners. Even a group of Jasper County fourth graders came out for a conservation field day in 2008. Proper tree farm practices, such as the establishment of food plots like this, continue to increase the wildlife on the place. There's even a pond for fishing. One day I decided I was going to, I said, I think I'll have some fish for dinner. <laughs> and went out to the pond and caught five fish and that was enough for dinner. <laughs> uh, it was fun. Roy Thigpen is an active member of the Jasper County Forestry Association, as well as the Mississippi Forestry Association. He enjoys sharing the lessons he's learned with others. His goal and vision for this tree farm remains the same as it was the day the property became his. We have tried to make sure that we um, continue what my dad started, try to make sure that we, we keep it up and I look forward to leaving it into it in better shape than what I found it. Those who know Roy Thigpen and know this tree farm will tell you the legacy is in good hands. From Montrose, Mississippi, I'm Leighton Spann reporting. And you can watch this story again on Roy Thigpen and his family at the Farm Week website or on the Facebook page or on the YouTube channel. The website address, farmweek.msucares.com. And we invite you to try out our Facebook page and give us a like if you wish. Facebook fans, remember, see our stories first on Fridays. And as you might imagine, uh, call the home phone during the working hours, and obviously Roy is out working, keeping that tree farm looking as fine as it does. But Julia, his wife, answered, uh, said they were doing fine. 
They did, however, find out they did not advance, which is hard to believe, to the regional tree farmer no. of the year competition. I can't believe it either. That is absolutely one of the most beautiful tree farms. I mean, we've been to a lot of tree farms, and they have put the work into it. They have continued the work that his dad started, but they haven't rested. They are not on his coattails. They have continued to push it on. Those trees are just absolutely beautiful and grow into the sky. Uh, there's also recreation involved too. It is just an absolutely beautiful tree farm and you can get a tree farm going like that too. And they emphasize, as you heard, prescribed burning as well as many other uh, best management practices. And that just shows some of what it takes to, to have a tree farm and to bring it along through uh, so many years. So get in touch with the Extension Service or the Mississippi Forestry Commission and start improving your land today. Well, it's time for today's trivia quiz on Farm Week. Now, today's Food Factor segment is about eggs, and so is today's trivia quiz. We want to know about egg yolks. Our question, egg yolks are one of the few foods that naturally contain this important nutrient. Is the answer vitamin B12, vitamin D, vitamin E, or vitamin K? We'll have the answer after today's Food Factor segment. Many of us are searching this time of year for a new splash of color to put in our landscapes. In this week's Southern Gardening segment at Stutch and Horticulturist, Dr. Gary Bachman says African daisies are a good pick for vibrant color and variety. When shopping for flowering plants this spring, be sure to take a look at African daisy. Also known as osteos, African daisies are outstanding flowering plants. Today I'm at Dogwood Ridge Farms where Barbara and Mike Levy are growing beautiful African daisies. These plants evolved in South Africa and are relatively new to many home gardeners. They have the familiar center disc and petals of the daisy family. The popular Serenity series will grow 10 to 14 inches tall and reach up to 20 inches wide in the landscape. Serenity colors include improved pink, dark purple, lemonade, honey gold, and lavender frost. There are two Serenity selections having spoon-shaped petals, White Bliss and Lavender Bliss. The unique shape shows the color contrast between the upper and lower surfaces of the petals. One of the most striking African daisy selections is the Zion Copper Amethyst, which will have good branching characteristics and flowers early in the season. It's the flowers that turn heads. The petals are pastel lavender with coppery orange tips. The center is a bright purple blue speckled with yellow stamens. Always grow in the full sun, keeping the planting media consistently moist. Add water soluble fertilizer weekly to promote continual flowering. So go ahead and try some African daisies in your garden this spring. I know you'll appreciate these colorful plants. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Gary says in cooler areas, the African daisy will bloom all summer. In hotter areas, it may take a break in the hottest part of the summer, but it will bloom again when the weather cools. Well, timing is everything when it comes to grocery shopping. Spending too much time in the store can cause you to go over your budget. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes of the Mississippi State University Extension Service tells us how to get time on our side when it comes to buying those groceries. If you want to save money at the grocery store, you've got to get in and get out fast. Shoppers typically spend more than $2 every minute they're in the store. So save money by changing your shopping routine. Shop the outer edges of the store first. You'll find nutritious and delicious whole foods like fruits and vegetables. Look high, look low. Search for hidden bargains that aren't at eye level. Since you're bargain honey, try the store brands and save 20 to 50%. Choosing frozen foods can also save money and are usually just as nutritious as fresh items. Canned goods are also a cheaper option. Just remember to watch out for those high sodium levels. A major shopping no-no? Push in the shopping cart when your stomach is empty. You're more likely to make impulse buys 
They'll bust your belly and your budget. The average American wastes about $600 worth of food each year. So stick with your list and keep your budget on track. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Natasha says keeping your pantry properly stocked will help eliminate those last minute grocery store trips where you end up buying more than you need. Well, it's time for the answer to today's trivia quiz here on Farm Week. We wanted to know what is special about egg yolks? What do they contain that most other foods don't? Well, the Farmer's Almanac says the answer is vitamin D. Vitamin D can be added to foods, but egg yolks contain it naturally. We're going to pause now for a break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll have the calendar and one more feature story for you. Rural residents want high-speed internet, but there's controversy on just how to do it. Each year, many Mississippians are seriously injured or killed when farm tractors overturn. One cause of these accidents is improper hitching. If a tractor is hitched at any point above the drawbar, it can flip over backwards. Never hitch a tractor using the bar between the three-point hitch upper and lower links or at the top link attachment point. The stationary drawbar is the only safe location for tractor hitching. A message from the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Before we get back to our last story, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. Mississippi State University will hold its Beef Unit Field Day on Saturday, May 2nd. It takes place at the Beef Unit Headquarters on the South Farm in Starkville. The hours are 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Lunch is provided. Breeding, nutrition, genetics, and stocker cattle health and management are among the items on the agenda. That afternoon, the Mississippi Cattlemen's Association will host Beef Day at the MSU-LSU baseball game. Please call to reserve a plate. Mississippi State University will hold a golf course management short course on Wednesday, May 18th. The location is the Dancing Rabbit Golf Club at Philadelphia. The hours are 8.45 a.m. to lunch. The cost is $50. That includes lunch and, and golf. Converting Bermuda grass greens and ultra dwarf Bermuda grass management are among the items to be covered. Participants can get recertification credit for Category 3 and 10 applicator licenses. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. While most urban residents would like faster broadband, any broadband at all would be welcomed by many rural residents. President Obama has proposed the Broadband USA program to put affordable, high-speed broadband into rural America. Some private companies who are already providing rural broadband service disagree with Mr. Obama's plan. One battleground for this fight is in the state of Iowa. Market to Market's David Miller reports. Hello, Cedar Falls! As part of his pre-State of the Union speech tour, the president traveled to Iowa to unveil his administration's plans to move the country forward over the next two years. Today, I'm in Cedar Falls to talk about how we can give more communities access to faster, cheaper broadband so they can succeed in the digital economy. Today, high-speed broadband is not a luxury, it's a necessity. The main reason Obama chose Cedar Falls for the announcement was its status as one of the first places in the world where every one of its 40,000 citizens have broadband access at speeds nearly 100 times faster than the national average. The faster broadband speeds put Cedar Falls on par with much larger cities like Hong Kong and Paris. So today, Cedar Falls is Iowa's first gigabit city. Now that sounds like something out of a Star Wars movie, <laughs> Gigabit City. Uh, here's what it means. Your network is as fast as some of the best networks in the world. There's Hong Kong, Tokyo, Paris, Cedar Falls. <laughs> right? That, that's, that's, 
That's the company you're keeping. The president went on to say that cyber growth in the U.S. had already been spurred on by the investment of almost $5 billion taken from the nearly six-year-old Economic Recovery Act used to slow the Great Recession. So far, Obama said 113,000 miles of network infrastructure were constructed or improved. Thousands of schools, libraries, and medical facilities had been connected to the Internet, and tax credits have been given to businesses that expanded their networks. Yep, so use December. That Responding to the president's in. remarks, Mediacom Communications, the nation's eighth largest cable television company and one of the leading cable operators focused on serving smaller U.S. cities, issued the following statement. Mediacom is deeply concerned with the comments made by President Obama during his visit to Cedar Falls Utilities. CFU is a municipal utility that leverages its government-conferred monopoly over electric, water, and gas service to unfairly compete with private enterprises for cable television and high-speed Internet customers. The president's remarks, combined with the selection of CFU as the venue for his speech, clearly show that the White House wants to waste taxpayer dollars to supplant our nation's private sector broadband providers with government-owned utility companies. According to federal government numbers, 98 percent of Americans have access to basic broadband Internet, but the future will require faster speeds and advanced delivery systems that will likely cost billions to put in place. A new White House report says that while 94 percent of Americans living in urban areas can purchase an Internet connection of 25 megabits per second, only 51 percent of those in rural areas have access to the same Internet speeds. Again, though, Mediacom CEO Rocco Camizo refuted the president's plan and his commitment to rural America, saying, since 1999, Mediacom has invested $2.8 billion in Iowa so that communities like Hamilton, with 35 households, and Goose Lake, with 98, can enjoy cable television, broadband, and VoIP telephone services comparable to those available in Chicago, Los Angeles, New York City, and Washington, D.C. I believe that Mediacom has invested more money in Iowa than any other private company over the last 15 years, and I am proud that not one dime of that investment has come from the government or taxpayers. And if folks do have good, fast Internet, chances are they only got one provider to pick from. As a way to boot up his idea, the president called on the Federal Communications Commission to remove barriers keeping local communities from expanding broadband. Obama wants to build on the billions in cyber funds already invested through the Recovery Act with the creation of a new program called Broadband USA. Administered by the Commerce Department, the Technical Assistance Plan will help guide communities through the ins and outs of constructing high-speed Internet infrastructure. And he noted that the Department of Agriculture is offering financial assistance through its Community Connect program, which provides financing to carriers that bring high-speed broadband to underserved rural areas. But we pulled together, we worked together, we relied on each other, we believed in each other, and we figured it out. We're blessed. With During Obama's 20-minute speech, however, no specific funding dollars were announced to implement the president's plan. Even with the issue of the public sector competing with its private counterpart unresolved and no details on how the government's commitment to underserved areas would be financed, both sides of the aisle agree the need for speed knows no political boundaries. A clear example of the idea crossing party lines was seen when Iowa Governor Terry Branstad, a Republican, tasked the Iowa legislature with adopting a similar program called Connect Every Acre. Together, let's put partisan politics aside and give rural Iowa the broadband legislation that connects every acre and connects communities to the careers of the 21st century. Closer to the ground, Dave Duncan, CEO of the Iowa Communications Alliance, which represents more than 130 community-based telecommunications providers, offered yet another perspective on the importance of high-speed broadband. Duncan notes that in addition to Cedar Falls, several other Iowa communities already offer gigabit Internet speeds directly to Iowa homes. 
But the bigger question that remains unanswered is exactly how both public and private broadband providers will hook up underserved areas so all Americans can fully realize the benefits of the digital age. For Market to Market, I'm David Miller. And you can watch this story on rural broadband. Once again, go to the Farm Week website, farmweek.msucares.com. You can also watch Farm Week stories on YouTube and Facebook. We'll have a link to the Market to Market website where you can see the story as well as read the entire script. Again, that's farmweek.msucares.com. And Leighton, of course, all areas need it now. If you've got a business, you've got to have access to some good internet. We are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, is your memory as bad as mine? We'll be taking you back for a look at the year 2014 in Mississippi agriculture. See what you remember about a record-breaking year. And the food factor will have some tips to tempt the picky eaters in your home. And in southern gardening, the southern indica azalea. It's a classic, and we'll have tips to keep yours looking their best. For the rest of the Farm Rate crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.